Shamal, welcome to the Way of Champions. Jerry and I are thrilled to have you on. We've both just been digging into your book, uh, Breathe, Believe, Balance, and uh, we, we got a lot of questions for you today. So welcome. Thank you so much, Jerry. Thank you so much, John, for welcoming me. Uh, I'm thoroughly excited to be here and, and deep dive. Yeah. Great. Well, well we're, we're, we're thrilled. We had a lot of questions. We had to pare them down, but I, I just want to start... Um, Maybe just tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and especially I think your background growing up in South Africa as an athlete and how that affected who you are as a human or who you maybe were as a human and how you see the world or how you saw the world. Yeah, thank you so much, John. You know, the background is really fascinating and it lays the foundation for everything that I do in sport today. Um, I grew up in South Africa. I'm of Indian descent. And uh, I grew up in the midst of the apartheid. So there was something called the quota system. For those who are not familiar, apartheid was institutionalized segregation of people of color. Mm -hmm. So institutionalized means that it was mandated by government and regulation that people of color could not attend certain universities, play certain sports, go to certain beaches, or have certain opportunities. It wasn't an undertone. It was regulated. So that was what the apartheid was. And I grew up wanting to play sport, and I was deeply passionate about it, playing cricket. Uh, I played state level, national level, under 13, under 15, under 17 growing up. And when I turned 18, I realized that there was really no opportunity because in an entire country with 70% of people of color across the different diaspora, there was only one opportunity or one place for a person of color in the national cricket team. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and and that really shattered my my dreams right there and then. And I had to, I was in a position where uh, to even get to that stage in my life, John, I had to do a lot of fighting at home with my parents because they came from a from a very very uh, timid background and they weren't prepared to help me deal with the atrocities of the apartheid. So they mm -hmm. kind of protect. So I had to really navigate and fight my way to get there. And when I hit that stone wall at 18, I had no idea what to do. I was scared to turn back. I knew I couldn't play because that was a fruitless exercise. And I immediately turned to, to education. And I said, you know what? Uh, I'm not ready to leave sport, professional sport. And my only other way to stay there would be to study the science of it and, and become a coach. And literally at the age of 18, I, I gave up playing professionally and I started coaching, uh, coaching senior levels. And it was literally a 24 hour shift from, you know, people who were my aspirational heroes becoming the people I had to uh, give a message of coaching to a, a, mm -hmm. the next day. And I was so scared, so petrified. Mm -hmm. It was a hard lesson because everything that you do to win the confidence of someone as a teammate was completely thrown out. And now I had to work to win the confidence as a coach from the same people mm -hmm. who, and, and now it was quite difficult because, uh, in the apartheid, when I was a player, they could have easily pushed me aside. But now I'm a coach and I'm one of three people who they mm -hmm. have to listen to, mm -hmm. you know. So it came with its own bundle. And I tried my best for a very, very long time. And uh, it, it got the better of me after some time. And, and at this stage, I'd gone, I'd played, probably worked and coached for about five or six years at the highest level. I'd even been to the Cricket World Cup with India as a technical analyst. Mm -hmm. And I came back and... It, it was it was still difficult to deal with and we'll, we'll get into that so i took a sabbatical from professional sport and i became a monk mm. and moved into a temple i moved into a temple uh i was really and truly running away from having to deal with that pain and stress and pressure i needed to find myself i didn't know how to show up every day mm. and uh and what was supposed to just be a day or two turned out to be about four years and after four years, when I wanted to start working and come back again, I felt uh, a lot more confident, a lot more reassured. And I'd also navigated completely from understanding the body as the center of performance to the mind as the center of performance mm. and the self as the center of performance. So those four years were pivotal because, as I explained in the book, it helped me discover myself, which is what I coach most athletes to do. Mm -hmm. And it also put front and center the power of the mind and self-belief in navigating your own journey towards success. So that's uh, that was where it was. Started off in South Africa in the apartheid, navigated from there, 
And and ever since there, I've, I've traveled the world working across multiple codes of sport. Mm, that's it's it's great. Um, and your your story is an amazing one. And I think what attracted both what Jerry and I to having you on the podcast as well is this. I mean, Jerry, would you say this melding of let, let's just call it Western education, right? So you have a, a degree in uh, in sport physiology or sports science, and then you right. have a master's in sports psychology, and then you spent three years as a monk. And so yeah. you bring in all the ancient yeah. tradition and the wisdom and that, and that's very much like, like Jerry. So, you know, Jerry, I don't know if you want to expand upon that, but that was kind of what you've done for many decades. Yeah, I I really appreciate uh, Shamal your your integration of all these different disciplines and cultures because you know we deal a lot of, with culture in sports and uh, sometimes it's ver- it's so unidimensional it's just the United States culture and here I pick up your book and I start learning from you what maybe I've been doing for many years as John has said which. All of a sudden, someone's saying there is a spirituality of sport yeah. and and there is a physiology, which we knew, uh, but it goes deeper than that, doesn't it? And, and that spiritual component, uh, those years uh, as a monk uh, have not left you. You're still a monk. You know, yeah. once a monk, always a monk, right? <laughs> and, 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 and so it really radiated uh, throughout the entire book for me. And uh, as you know, if you're familiar with the stuff I've been doing for years, I bring in a lot of Eastern philosophy, the Tao and yeah. Buddha and uh, and Native American too. And and it just seems to make your work so much richer. Do you, you agree with that? Oh, I absolutely. You know, I, I keep telling people when we, when we coach and, and you guys will all know this is we cannot guarantee success. All we do is we try to help the athlete show up in the best way and we moving from where they are to, to better. We trying to coach. I, I, I always say I'm, I'm coaching the human behind the athlete, the human behind the CEO. That's what we're trying to do. And uh, the spiritual aspect is rarely and truly the foundation of everything I do. And, you know, to elaborate, one of the first things I start off by, by talking to an athlete about when I start is uh, I, I describe to him a verse that is very, very close to me. That is my entire philosophy of how I live my life. And that verse is, comes from a, a Vedic scripture called the Bhagavad Gita, which is very, very close to Hindu Vedic philosophy. And that verse is from chapter 18, verse 14, where in that conversation, they're describing the five things that are needed for success. And I explain these five things to an athlete. And it says that the first thing is you need to be the right person for the job which means you need to be competent. The mm. second one is you need to be in the right place where those skills are needed. Mm. Okay. The third thing is you need to have the right tools available to execute your skill. Right? Without the, those tools, success will not happen. The fourth thing is even with that, you still need to bring the right amount of effort, hard work. There's no getting away from hard work. And in that, in that scripture, they say these four things are, are in your control. Mm -hmm. The fifth thing is not in your control. And they use multiple words to describe it. Some people call it luck. Some people call it destiny. Some people call it faith. But what that fifth represents is the invisible energy, John, Jerry, Mm -hmm. things that you didn't do that happened to bring it all together, Mm -hmm. that things that were beyond your control. And I explained to my athletes that humility is the ability to recognize the invisible energy in your success. Mm. And why do I start there? I start there because when you're an athlete, you are an eternal student of your sport. Mm. And humility is the foundation upon which learning happens. Mm. So without humility, there cannot be any learning. So this is the first place I put the pin in the ground with any relationship with any sport. That's where I, I generally like to start. So, so let me just add something and nod yes or no. Uh, gratitude has to be part of that oh, humility yes. to be grateful for all you've been given. Correct? Of course, of and course. One, without it. And one of the things that I've run up against, and perhaps you have too, and John, I think maybe you do, when as you're speaking this way, is people hear the word spirituality and they start thinking religion, and 
for me personally, it's not about religion. It's about humility. It's about gratefulness. It's about courage. It's about sure. perseverance, selflessness. So what you're really telling us is that this is about certain spiritual qualities, which yeah. really come from inside, from our, I call it coming from our heart and, 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 and opening up the heart and, and allowing ourselves to become one with whatever we're involved in. But you're smiling, so I'm going to let you take over from there. <laughs> no, Jerry, I'm laughing because you describe it. But when someone asks me, what is spirituality? I tell them spirituality is a journey from head to heart. Yeah. Head is the metrics according to what the world is telling you you should measure yourself by. The heart is you feeling what you should measure yourself by. And spirituality is the journey that takes you between that. And, you know, I tell people it's, it's a foot apart but it's probably the longest journey you'll ever embark in on your life. You know, yeah, it's a yeah. journey of endless yeah. learning. It's a journey yeah. of sacrifice. Yeah. 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 Eight, that, that crazy 18 inches from your head to your heart. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, John, I just, I, a, as I hear this, I, I think what's so important that I want to really highlight is right for any athlete or any coach, right. Our listeners here are mostly coaches who are on at some level of this journey. Uh, we always talk about these things you control. So you you control, you know, developing the tools and being in the right place and surround, surrounding yourself with the right people. And then, you know, like I feel like a lot of people just sit around waiting for the energy of the universe to hand them something and then they're completely unprepared for it, right? And And the journey is really preparing, preparing, preparing. Um so that when that energy hits, you, you're ready and all the tools are in place, right? Um, whether it's your chance, you know, to get into the lineup on a team because someone gets injured, you got to be ready in that moment. Not, oh, just give me two weeks and I'll be able to fill in, <laughs> you know? Um, and and exactly. so I, I think this is just such an important subject for people to listen to that you are on this journey of preparation for that moment and you don't know when it's coming. But you have to be humble enough to receive it and 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 grateful enough to understand what you've been given and prepared enough to take advantage of it. Every single thing you said is spot on. And why does an athlete practice endlessly every single day? I, I say this almost every day of my life to someone in the corporate world who's waiting for an opportunity and then wants a month to prepare for it. I said, the greatest travesty on earth is to get an opportunity that you're not prepared for. Yeah. You know, that is the greatest travesty. So athletes are working every day because an opportunity in our world of athletics is one, one hundredth of a second or one second, or it's just one ball, one blink of an eye and it's gone. And we train, we dedicate our life towards mastery because there is just no greater travesty than getting that opportunity that you're not prepared for. And, um, and that's the one beautiful thing. And, and I tell people, you know, uh, sport for me is very much like any spiritual practice. The longer you stick to it, you start to see the world through the lens of that practice. Mm -hmm. And this is what makes athletes and coaches so remarkable as people to listen to and people to learn from. Because the entire cycle of life, the entire cycle of a decade and a century it filters through the exact same lens mm -hmm. which not too many other fields in the world have that privilege mm -hmm. you know because they're being navigated by so many other variables mm -hmm. so it's a really beautiful privilege that we have mm -hmm. so that leads us to the idea and the concept of coaches out there listening to us that they're teaching a sport but they're teaching life and the more aware we become as leaders, as coaches, according to what you're saying, then we better be ready to help athletes understand that they're, they're not just learning a sport, but they're learning a tool that will help them learn about themselves and life. And as Joseph Campbell, the great scholar, once said in his hero's journey, he said, everything I know about myself right now came through sport and he was able in his genius to be able to see the connection between 
oh, I just screwed that up. Well, what did I learn? I, I learned that, you know, failure and setback are my teacher. And, and, and this, this is, you know, in the Tao Te Ching, they say, you lose yet in this way win. And, and, and so now we're all coming together. And I'm so thrilled to know you're out there in another part of the world helping athletes to know how, how to know themselves. And then the sport is a reflection of that. Absolutely. Absolutely. The sport will always be a reflection of the learnings in you. And we play such a pivotal, to all the coaches listening, we play such a pivotal role because we're now touching, going to touch a lifespan of 90 years because of all of the longevity practices and sciences that are coming in. But an athlete's lifespan from birth will go up to about 30, 35 years if you're lucky. Mm -hmm. So the first third of them, we lay the foundation in the first third for the quality of their life and how they experience everything in the next two thirds. Mm -hmm. So when we say sport is really and truly the blueprint for how you live your life, it can be that if you can bring a level of mindfulness to every single thing. One of the, one of the beautiful things about, I, I tell an athlete is never ever start a session if the purpose of the session is not clearly defined. Mm -hmm. Never start it. You know, because from clarity of purpose comes clarity of execution. Mm. Now, just that simple, simple sentence, if every person brought that into their life and started every single activity that they did, including a conversation with someone with clarity of purpose, can you imagine what, what a beautiful life they would live? Yeah. Just, just that simple sentence. Yeah. Yeah, I'm let's, writing like crazy here. Yeah. Let's get I was taking notes too. Let's um gain some clarity on one of the key concepts of your book, which is in the title, but it's this idea of balance. And I and I read through your introduction a couple of times because balance is something that Jerry and I talk about a lot. Balance is something that we get asked about all the time. Uh, and I think a fundamental misunderstanding of what balance is to an athlete, right? And for for Jerry and I often to a student athlete, so someone who is uh, a, a high level NCA performer and taking rigorous studies and trying to have a social life and do all these other things, they they they, they throw out this idea of balance, and I don't think a lot of them. Um, understand it. And then you really go into depth. And I, Jerry and I want to spend some time on this to gain some clarity on this, because I think you explain it really, really well. And I don't know where to start. So I'll let you start. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Thanks, John. Uh, John, like you, the reason I wrote a book about balance was because that word was in every person's vocabulary every single day. Mm -hmm. And nobody could elaborate on it or give me a blueprint for how to achieve it. Mm -hmm. And every time you spoke to anyone about balance, they confused it with symmetry, equal and opposite. Mm -hmm. So when someone says, hey, I need a balanced life, that means if they're working eight hours, they need to sleep eight hours and then spend eight hours with family. Now, that could be a simple formula in this, but after a while, it doesn't become as simple as one is to one. And when I looked at some of the greatest minds, I found that that formula didn't actually stack up, but yet they were healthy and they were living. So I started to look at balance in its most natural ecosystem. So I started looking at astrology, cosmology. I started looking at nature. I started looking at how plants grew. And every time I noticed a balance in an ecosystem, symmetry was not there. In mm -hmm. fact, everything was asymmetrical, but it moved in an asymmetrical pattern that in itself maintained a balance. So, for example, uh, one of the things that I maintain in the book is that, for example, if you eat a sugary donut that has 20 grams of sugar in it, your body doesn't secrete 20 grams of insulin to bring that into balance. It will secrete far less than that, a tenth of that if that. If you look at rabbit populations in the wild, you don't need as many wolves to keep that in check. You need a tenth of that. 
If you look at the golden ratio, it's not symmetrical. So in every single naturally occurring system, asymmetry is balance. Okay. So I took that system forward. And then what I tried to do was I, I tried to quantify life into four different quadrants. And the four quadrants I, I called it was our body, which is the vehicle for everything. Mm -hmm. Our mind, which controls the quality of our thoughts, the relationships, which is the environment that we operate in, because sports science has shown us the nature versus nurture relationship, how important the nurture component is. Okay. And the third is your environment itself, mm -hmm. where you're operating. And what I try to show people in the book is that there are a few things about balance. Balance A is not static. Mm -hmm. It's not a place. It's not a destination that you will get to. Right. The second thing is it's not symmetrical. Mm -hmm. And the third thing is it's fluid and dynamic. It's ever evolving and ever changing. So that brought the fundamental question of if something is changing constantly every second, how do you have control over that ecosystem? Okay. Well, there are two important things. One is to recognize that control is a myth. Mm -hmm. You cannot have control over it. <laughs> the second is to identify that everything that's in balance has to be balancing on a central point. Mm -hmm. Okay, central point. And the integrity of that central point will determine how stable that is. So mm -hmm. for example, like the example I give, if, if I tell someone, if you take a big block and you try to balance it on a single nail, you may get it right. If I give you a cube that's solid or a brick, you will have more success. But if I give you something that's completely unstable, like a tiny water balloon, it becomes mm -hmm. incredibly difficult. Mm -hmm. Now, what you're trying to balance is still the same. The only thing that's changed is the central point, the fulcrum. Mm -hmm. And what I'm trying to teach people that in the quest for balance, right, what we should be looking at is the integrity of the central point and the central point is you. How mm -hmm. well do you know yourself? Because mm -hmm. if you know yourself well enough, you will be able to navigate anything that throws you off balance and mm -hmm. you will be able to reestablish a quick equilibrium. Mm -hmm. So the whole book goes in to explaining a person as Jerry has been saying, how important it is to know yourself. How important is our role in teaching them the life lessons that reflect their choices. That is fundamentally what will put an athlete in the best position to not just navigate external variables on the field, but also off the field. And, and this is where, you know, you can see where some athletes get it wrong because sport is a finite game. It has a fixed time frame. It has a set amount of rules. Everything is predefined. So mm -hmm. you can control variables in a predefined system very easily. Mm -hmm. But life is not a finite game. Life is mm -hmm. an infinite game mm -hmm. where the rules are changing and not everyone's playing by the same set of rules. Mm -hmm. This is why athletes who are so successful on field struggle to navigate when people are playing by a different set of rules mm -hmm. because they've not been taught the lessons of understanding themselves and understanding how their core values should be used to navigate the variables around them. Mm. It's wow. wonderful, wonderful. Go ahead. Yeah, Go ahead, yeah. I, I was just thinking as you as you're speaking, it becomes a rather personal thing, doesn't it? It's like individual where so many athletes that I've worked with and John, I'm sure you agree with this. We'll get a room of 35 athletes. They're all trying to define balance the same way, which is, OK, so I have I play three hours of sport. I have three hours of social life. I have three hours of studying. Now I'm all in balance. Whereas, you know, someone else comes along and says, you know what, I don't need to study for three hours. So am I out of balance, right? So it's a very, the, the listeners out there who are trying to achieve what you're talking about really need to know themselves and understand what it's going to take for them to perform and, and, and to be uh, the full human capacity person that they, they wish to be, the best version of themselves. Oh, you absolutely right, Jerry. I keep telling people, and, 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 this, and this holds true for this conversation as well. If anything that I'm saying resonates with you, then I have not taught you that. That knowledge is inside you. All we've done is we've activated it. 
-hmm. right? Because when you are in a group, all we can do is activate innate learning that's already in you. But true learning, the true discovery of new knowledge can only happen by oneself. So only when you are fundamentally comfortable by yourself in solitude, right, will you truly discover who you are and how you can move forward. Yeah, but I'm a coach and I know, I'm supposed to know everything. And because I know everything, I'm going to tell you what you need to know. So how do you argue that? I mean, you know, I'm getting paid to coach these people. I, I'm the expert. You're, you're, you're proposing something very – a different way of thinking here. Yes, I am. I am pro proposing because fundamentally as a coach, you know, I tell people what we're doing is creating the optimal environment for people to discover skills – to enhance skills and to plug that skills into a system. You know, that's what we're doing. Yes, maybe you're tweaking your technique. Maybe I'm also bringing uh, changes in. I have a few models that we can talk about that I look around performance. I have all of that there. But can I claim that I've really made that person a champion? No, I've not. You know, there's a lot of systems in place that I have through my years of experience and wisdom have understood that if I navigate and create these together, I'm creating probably the best environment for like-minded, like-hearted people to flourish. Mm -hmm. You know, That's the way I look at coaching. Yeah. I don't walk into any system saying I made that person. I've not made anyone, mm -hmm. you know. So yeah. the environment has to feel safe, if I read you correctly, where if I fail, I'm not a... I'm not a failure. I just failed and I'm going to learn from that. So it's a safe environment where I feel free to really discover my innate best qualities and you reinforce them, making some suggestions on the side. Does that sound pretty accurate? That sounds absolutely correct. And safety is the important word. But psychological safety is a concept that was born from child psychology. One of the areas I work and I write about in that book, because a child can only explore the unknown with a level of curiosity and courage from a place of psychological safety. So if you remove safety, no one can explore the unknown and no one can bring curiosity ah. to that system. So in, in an ecosystem like a locker room where you want people to try to be courageous and curious with a certain limited skill set that needs to come together around one defined goal, which is to win that match, it can only happen on a bedrock of psychological safety. Mm. You know, it, it's it's funny. I, I just think of this real world example that has nothing to do with sport. But my family, we we work with our local humane society, you know, the animal shelter, and we <clears throat> foster young puppies and and kittens before they're old enough to be be adopted. So downstairs in my house right now, I have two little kittens that are seven weeks old or whatever. But I think about them. You know, when we got them a week and a half ago. Right. You open the little cage and they sort of crawl out, but then they go and they hunker down in there until they know that it's safe to come out. Right. Absolutely. And, and then as it gets safe, they venture further and and they try new things. And now, you know, a week and a half later, they're running around climbing on everything, you know, just going crazy. You there's an ottoman at our couch. And at first they sort of cautiously try to go across and they constantly fail because they're trying to step across. And then they realize that they can jump. And now they just on the dead run, jump, fly off the edge, do this, do that. And and it's like this <laughs> microcosm of watching psychological safety in action that the safer they feel the more things that they'll try and even when they fail they'll just try it again the next time you know they kind of have this short-term memory to it as well and and so it's such an important concept for sure well it's john you hit the nail on the head it's 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 everything you know and the more psychological safety you bring to a system the stronger the culture of curiosity is in that system. Mm -hmm. And and the fastest way, we, we use the word culture a lot. And the way I describe it and I tell people is, you know, culture is uh, the gap between what you say and what you do. That's mm -hmm. culture, mm -hmm. you know. And, and I tell people, I, I said this recently, I said sometimes the fastest way to erode the performance of an athlete is for a coach to not stick to his word. Yeah. You know, because once you've said something and gone back on that, you you've entirely eroded the trust 
and the culture in that ecosystem. So now that person's operating in a silo, right? Now, if they don't trust the system and the, the byproduct of that is not, even, they're gonna completely reverse back into survival mode, which is gonna be reflected in their playing methodology. So it's so subtle and, and it's so important to, to have more active conversations around that thing. Mm-hmm. 100%. I don't want to leave balance just yet, Jerry, if you're okay with me asking. I'm perfectly or, fine with that. Yeah, because I, I just think the, the the things that you talk about and these concepts, right, <laughs> asymmetry versus symmetry. And I think you use an example in the book of, you know, if you're 22 years old and just out of university and you're not married and you don't have children, you may work 15 hours a day. That's not being out of balance at that time in your life. Right. If you've got four children in a relationship and you're 18 hours at the office every day, something might not be you, you something's not balanced there in terms of developing or raising children or something like that. Um, this idea, I am just going through these things. I love this idea of the that hard fulcrum, right? The more solid that is, which means the more self-awareness you have, um, the easier it is to put something on it, right? And when you're not self-aware, when it's soft, when you don't have core values and things that guide you and drive you, um, then you can't balance anything on it. And, and, and Jerry, this makes me think of, you know, Steve Kerr when he became the Warriors coach saying, well, what is the solid fulcrum that I want to build this team on? Right. And it was joy and account of, you know, competitiveness and compassion and mindfulness, right? Like he came up with these things that said, this is what this environment is going to be like. That's the solid foundation. And now we can bring in different personalities and different people and experience different things, but the foundation is solid. And I think so many coaches and so many athletes never never really build that foundation. And that's sort of the one of the core elements of the beginning of your book for sure, right, Shamal? Absolutely. Let's let's take this little one step further and, and explain why it's so pertinent right now. You know, maybe three or four decades ago, when a person was a professional athlete, firstly, the volume of competition was significantly less. So mm-hmm. the volume has doubled, you know, over the last two decades. And there's also the advent of more competition. So you find one professional athlete could play in four or five different tournaments. If he's called for national duty, then he's got a coach. Then he's got a coach in the team. If he gets selected into another franchise, he's playing in that. And this is all happening in one season. So, for example, in in cricket or in football, a single player could be exposed to at least five different coaches in an entire year. Right Now, five coaches are bringing their philosophy of what culture is and mm-hmm. their philosophy of what they think you need. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine what is going to happen to you if you don't know yourself? Mm-hmm. What is the chances of you getting through the end of the year? Maybe you muscle through year one, year two. But this is why mental health issues is such a big problem is because there's too much of an investment in the system and not enough of an investment in helping them understand themselves. Mm -hmm. Because when you understand yourself, you know, the system will take care of itself Mm -hmm. because you know how much to give and how to give that in. Yeah. And, and I think the, the whole idea of, of that is if you don't have that solid, self that solid idea and you're constantly then trying to um fit into someone else's idea of you and and none of that's a criticism of any of those three to five coaches every one of those coaches can be exceptional every one of those environments can be exceptional um and i think what that breeds is fear and that's like another concept here that so many athletes struggle with is fear but if i don't know who i am then i'm always afraid that i'm letting down the person who's my coach in this moment who i'm supposed to be helping so maybe talk about fear for a moment within this idea john i love this so in the book i explain one beautiful thing and i think this is fundamentally important for everyone to know is that the brain is a creature of habit. Mm -hmm. This is why there's so many books on habits. And this is why 
we press on routine so much because once there's a routine and a habit in place, the brain by default knows how to operate in that. Now, if you take that, just that simple philosophy as well, where the monkey mind moves to is also a habit, right? It doesn't happen by chance to go in different directions. It's going to the exact same place every single time. Mm -hmm. And in understanding the self and cultivating the self, we need to know where it's going to. So the mind can only be in one of two places. If it's not now in the present right here, it can only be in the past or it can be in the future. It can't be anywhere else. And if it's in those two places, it can only be thinking of one of two things. It can be thinking of something positive or something negative. So you're looking at past positive or past negative. You're looking at future positive or future negative. Now let's break this down. If the mind goes to the past and it's thinking of something positive, then you're going to have thoughts of overconfidence mm -hmm. because you've been thinking of past success. Mm -hmm. If the mind goes to the past and you're thinking of something negative, okay, then there's going to be that fear of failure because that negative thing is going to be ruminating again. Mm -hmm. If the mind goes to the future and you're thinking of something positive, then you're going to start to premeditate your actions. Mm -hmm. And you're going to dull yourself to changing variables. Mm -hmm. If the mind is going to the future and you're thinking of something negative, then you're going to have a paralysis of action. You won't even move. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, the mind will go to the same place every single time for each person. Mm -hmm. And the intervention of bringing it back depends on where it goes for each person. So in getting to know who you are and how to control yourself, the first thing you need to know is where is the mind going to? Mm -hmm. Because that's where you'll know how to pull it back from. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, when we talked of fear as an emotion, fear as an, as an emotion is locked in to anything in the future. Mm -hmm. You're right. You, you're projecting forward yeah. and you're scared of that outcome. And then that's where that fear is linked to something that could happen or could not happen. Stoicism talks a lot about that. Mm -hmm. Now, with these four places that the mind goes to, our only job is to bring it back to the here and now. Mm -hmm. Okay, And in psychology, what we have to do is we call it, we need to intercept a thought. We need to, and reframe that thought. Mm -hmm. That's all we need to train. And if you can intercept and reframe, and if you can do this and integrate this into routines in your practice and your play, you'll always bring your mind back to the here and now. And that is your best place for you to perform. So to anyone who wants to understand how to cultivate the self, the awareness of self starts with the awareness of the pattern that the mind jumps to. Mm -hmm. Because if it's going to a past failure, it does not matter how many wins you've had. Okay, The brain will find one mistake and amplify it at a ratio of two is to one on anything positive, mm -hmm. no matter how many positives they are. Okay. If you are a person, and we see this with athletes whose mind moves to overconfidence, they've had a string of failures, right? But they still fundamentally believe I'm great. I'm great. I'm great. I'm great. And as a result, they're not willing to change anything. And then after a while, they get cut from the team. So, you know, when the mind moves to a certain place, it's independent of the reality of the situation, mm -hmm. which is why self-awareness is so important. Mm. Uh, you know, th th John, this is, uh, this is what you and I have attempted to, to really help our, our athletes with, but our coaches as well. And uh, I'm aware that there are, we have 70 to 80,000 thoughts a day, a day. And on the average, and I don't know who calculated this, but <laughs> from what I understand is we have a ratio of 16 to 1, negative to positive. So at the end of the day, if we're not doing something, and I'm going toward the realm of implementation here, but if you have 60, uh, 80,000 thoughts a day and 16 to 1 are negative, at the end of the day, you're not, you, you'd have to agree with me, you're not going to have a good day. 
if you just pay attention to that. But let's say you change that around and let's say you're optimistic and, and, and you believe in yourself and, and you have awareness and, and you're patient and you're courageous and you have integrity and gratitude and, and courage and selflessness. And you ha- I, you'd have to agree that that might be a good day for you. So the people out there that are listening, I want to go from the theory, which is absolutely spot on what you're trying to nail here, from theory to practicality. And maybe you can jump in here and, and, and just tell us, I mean, what I do is, you know, myself is I have this, uh, this stack of cards here and here they are. And, and, and these are affirmations. First one, I'm so humbled and grateful for all the opportunities coming my way at this moment and do what I can to continue making a difference in the lives of others. I read that every morning. That puts me on the right path. That's implementation. And I love your, your, your work in this area. However, I'm just afraid that some of these coaches, they, they're not going to, it sounds good, but how, what do we do about it? How do we change that? The, in sport, one of the things all coaches are trying to close is the gap between strategy and execution. Mm-hmm. Isn't it? You know, we all have amazing strategies, the execution <laughs> flaws, and that's the difference between wins and losses. When it comes to the other more important gap is the gap between desire and willingness. You know, everyone on the planet has a desire for something, and only a small percentage of people have the willingness to take action every single day. You know, when when I look at performance, uh People ask me, what's the ultimate secret to success at the highest level? Because that's where I've spent a lot of my time coaching. I tell people the highest, the the one variable that is the biggest differentiator is composure, is stillness at the height of pressure. If you, the calmer you are when everyone else is trembling in the boots, your probability of success goes up drastically. You know, so the only way you're going to get that stillness is from, I break it up into three seeds as such, and, and, and all three are important. The first C comes from, I call it competence, which is knowledge. You know, your coaches, your mentors, doing your preparation work, studying your videos, doing all of that. The second one comes from confidence. And not the confidence of words, but the confidence of action. So showing up and repeating that skill over and over and over till the skill dominates the subconscious mind. Mm-hmm. Okay. The third way, the third variable that you need is conditioning. A physically supremely fit body. Why? Because stress is a cognitive function that manifests physically in the body, which means that your heart rate variability will shoot up, you shoot down, your heart rate will shoot up, your respiratory rate will increase. All of these changes will happen in the body. So you need to be physically resilient enough to be the fittest person at the moment of pressure. If you bring these three variables together, the probability of being the calmest person in that situation is very, very high. And if you're the calmest person, the probability of you winning becomes significantly high as well. So for anyone listening and and to coming back to Jerry's question, how do we get them to do this? Is that if you don't show up every single day to do this, then in in the world of child psychology, we say we use the word Mm self-sabotage. For every single day that you don't show up, you have self-sabotaged your own success. Okay. And the fastest way to circumnavigate self-sabotage is to inject yourself in an environment where every person in that ecosystem <laughs> treats those three C's like the Holy Grail. Because the mind, as Jerry says, 80,000 thoughts, 16 to 1 ratio of negative to positive. Right. The only way you can beat those odds is your ecosystem. Right. 
And if you spend enough time in the right ecosystem, then you'll be good enough to maintain a level of discipline with those three things in any ecosystem. This is a lesson that comes from, uh, there's a book in Vedic philosophy, it's called Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, where they speak of the five states of mind. Mm -hmm. And the Saint Patanjali was very, very wise. And he says that there's a mind that you'll inject into any environment and they will become a byproduct of that environment. And they will be a type of mind that will be able to rise above that environment, but only for a few minutes. And most of us are there. So you do some meditation or breath work and you have a level of calmness at that moment. But as soon as you go into your office, the stress of that it impacts you. And then if you keep sticking with that practice, you get to a stage where you start influencing your environment. You know, so you see, we walk into certain rooms and some people are so charismatic and calm that every single person in that room responds to their energy. They're mm -hmm. not responding to your energy. That is the cultivation of the mind through the showing up of practicing a skill repeatedly every single day. Mm -hmm. And I think, John, if I may, mm -hmm. I, I think one of those skills is, see, I'm a pragmatist and uh, my... I think one of my strengths is taking theory and put it into practice. And uh, I've written books that are very theoretical. It doesn't work for me. So right now I'm thinking to myself, these coaches, what they need is something practical because I know this to be true. If, if I change my thoughts, I change my day. If I change my thoughts, I change my life. And so thoughts are like clouds, right? So you look up in the sky and the clouds are drifting by. Oh, there's a cloud. Oh, there it goes. Goodbye, cloud. And a thought is the same way, isn't it? I mean, a thought comes into your mind. Oh, that's a thought. You just label it. That's all it is. There's no me to it. It's not real. It's not yes and no or true or false. It's just a thought and say, huh, that's not a thought that I really need that's going to make me go forward. But here's a thought that will make me go forward. So Maybe what we need to do is we need to look at all our negative thoughts and make a list of them and then completely change them. And then every day, maybe being pragmatic, how do you feel about maybe we just recite those thoughts in a state of mind that, as you say, is calm and relaxed so that we can really make that uh, imprint on our nervous system. And then you take the thought in and imagine it to be true and feel it to be true and then do that on a regular basis. Do you like that idea? Or is that something that, you know, we should talk no, about? No, I, I, I absolutely, I, I love the idea. You know, I love the idea of changing your thoughts. I, I love the concept of, and to make it simpler is, see the brain, uh, Jerry, is a creature of habit. So one of the things that we need, so we can write the notes and we can put our sticky notes out everywhere. But there's a concept that I talk about in the book, and, and we use it a lot in helping to intercept the negativity and reframe. And I call it the penalty for failure. So the penalty for failure is if you do not teach the brain that that is an unacceptable pattern, it will recur along that pattern. So there has to be an intercept for a negative thought. There ha like, like an athlete, like, you know, uh, for example, you know, uh, we know this, uh, if you take, for example, arriving late at a practice, you see most sports teams would have some penalty. You'll either find them a monetary, or monetary value or you'll make them sit out that practice. Or if it's kids, you'll probably send them to do a few laps around the field. What is that? That is a pain, right, to a habit that is not acceptable in the cultivation of excellence. Okay, now, if there's no pain, right, you're not going to switch to understanding the pleasure of that habit. So everything is a relationship between pain and pleasure. So if a habit that is seeming pleasurable in that moment, but doesn't have a long-term impact on you, has to be changed to a painful experience for them to recultivate a habit that will create long-term pleasure, long-term success. So the penalty for failure for every coach out there is, you know, if you want to change something, right, identify what is that one thing that every time it happens, you're going to do 
So it could be putting five five dollars in a jar and you donate that money to charity. Or if you're not showing up for a certain practice or doing something yourself, I'm going to do an extra lap or I have to do this. So as a writer, I remember saying to myself, I was going to write 2000 words a day before I ate breakfast. And I stuck to that. And sometimes if I had other things to do, I never ate anything up to 2 p.m. But <laughs> that, that, that rule was there. I had, yeah. It had to be there. Because yeah. if I broke the rule, then the brain thinks I could break it every day. So let me, you know, I think as I'm putting on my coaching hat and thinking about this, I think a lot of coaches really focus on, okay, if we have these four areas of the body and the mind and the environment and the relationships, um, we pay tons of attention to the body, the physical preparation, the training, the technical development. I think people are starting to pay more attention to the mind. Um, I still don't think they pay enough attention to the environment and the relationships and recognize yeah. their influence that they can have over those. I can't make you like me, but I can make, I can create an environment where we respect each other and where we do certain things for the good of the group, because we both understand that the success of the group depends upon our contribution to it. And I, I, you know, I'm thinking Jerry and I had a guest a couple of weeks ago, uh, Sherry Cole, who is a very famous basketball coach. And she just wrote a book and sort of her analogy that she started every season was the redwood tree, right? And the redwoods, hundreds of feet high and massive diameter trees and 2000 year olds only grow their roots down six to 12 feet, but they grow them out a hundred feet. And they intertwine with all the other redwoods and together they hold themselves up in an earthquake in the wind in any storm and survive for thousands of years. And I, I think that's such a wonderful analogy for a team and for a coach that you need to cultivate redwoods, right? You need, you need to focus on that environment and that intertwining of your people and those relationships within, um, how can a coach be more mindful of those things and not just get stuck on developing the body? Such a fabulous, fabulous question. Uh, let me let me give you an analogy and, 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 and a scientific story as well. You know, they studied the Alcoholics Anonymous and they found that, you know, people who went into the Alcoholics Anonymous, there was an 80% relapse. Great after just a few years, relapse rate, 80%. That's significantly high. But that number changed drastically to well below 40 when they made everyone who'd gone through the program a mentor of someone else who was coming into the program. Mm -hmm. Because now you're not just giving advice, but you have to live that advice mm -hmm. as well. So how do you cultivate redwoods in a locker room? Mm -hmm. Is you have to create a system where they're holding each other's hands. You have to create a mentoring system where, you know, the All Blacks, the rugby team do this really well. And it's ingrained in the way, in the entire thing. They say that legacy is, for the All Blacks, is every person has to respect everyone who wore a jersey because that person has established the credibility of that jersey. And everyone who's wearing a jersey has a responsibility to leave it in a better place. Okay. Now, in that statement there is the ethos of holding each other. So I love what you're saying. But the only way that's going to happen is if in the culture and the operating system of the team, we create a system in which the old, the more experienced, the more mature, have a vested interest in pulling the next person in. And the next person. And in, there's a beautiful saying we have in professional sport. We say the strength of a team is directly proportional to the strength of the reserve bench. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, that is the Redwood philo philosophy. Mm -hmm. Your reserve bench can only be great mm -hmm. if you have the Redwood methodology. Mm -hmm. Now, and, and the Kenyan philosophy is good people make people great. I spent eight years working with these runners and good people make people great. So they go out and they find the best talent and they pull them in and they look after them and they nurture them. Right. So, 
how is this going to happen for all the coaches? Is you have to create mental saliency. This has to be the point that you bring to the locker room for it to be a byproduct of that locker room. Mm -hmm. mm. I like it. As I had a just discussion in the local soccer club that I coach in yesterday about creating a coach mentorship program where people are directly responsible for mentoring young coaches. And I've done that for a while where people would come and assist me for six months or a year, but you know, there's too many people to get to. Right. And so we, you know, so we were like, well, we do have these great senior coaches. What if we just assign people to these, to these coaches and then they're off and running. And, and I, I only have two or three and I can watch a practice and I can walk them through. And I think this is the same thing with the athletes, right? So here's this, especially on a university or a professional level, here's the senior, here's the new person to the team. They need to be welcomed in and, and, and shown with great humility and gratitude. Here's the shirt you're wearing. Um, here's how you can leave it in a better place. So that someday you can show someone how to leave the shirt in a better place. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well said. Yeah. And be intentional about that. Jerry, I know you wanted to talk about forgiveness and some more relationship stuff. Let me, I think this is probably a good time to do that because well, we're running well, out of time. It, you, you kind of read my mind there because uh, when I read the book, the thing that really first jumped off the pages was this idea of forgiveness. And it's not a topic that most coaches are a adept at discussing or b even think about how important forgiveness is in terms of how you feel about yourself, not who you're forgiving. And then if you're feeling that good about yourself, you kind of feel like, you know what, now I can be who I am. And that gets back to your idea of self-examination, doesn't it? So I'm just wondering if, uh, you know, let's talk more about that, if you will. Yeah, absolutely, Jerry. I think uh, for all the coaches listening out there, <clears throat> you know, forgiveness can be a very can be a term that seems very esoteric, and it it belongs more in the spiritual realm than actually on the sports field or in the coaching realm. Mm -hmm. But the reason I brought this in purposely is because one's inability to forgive or ability to forgive is directly linked to having a champion mindset or a victim mindset. You see, when you get stuck and you feel that someone's done something to you, and you cannot forgive them or move them, that means that you're still holding them responsible for the trajectory of your life. And that means that you're rendering yourself powerless. Now, if you are rendering yourself powerless with that victim mindset, the probability of you moving forward is directly proportional to who gives you an opportunity, and that's the worst place to be. So the reason I brought forgiveness in is because I want it to be a tool of empowerment because I want my athlete to realize that in forgiving, you rise past anything that anyone does to you and you take control of your life. You realize that the trajectory of my life is directly proportional to what I put in and not what someone does to me. And I wrap that around the term of forgiveness. Yeah, beautifully said. And 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 may I say this, after 45 years of working with, I don't know, over 350 teams, there hasn't been one team where forgiveness wouldn't have been appropriate. So coaches out there are listening and saying, well, you know, my team doesn't need forgiveness. Oh, yes, they do. There's always some athlete on the team who's doing something that's annoying somebody else or does something unfair to somebody else. Or there's a coach that maybe does something unfair to a team or vice versa. And, you know, it, it's amazing how important this is because forgiveness is something you can control. And it's, it's you know, and, and, and the other thing is, is the forgiving of somebody else. It's not about the other person. It's about freeing yourself up, isn't it? Freeing yourself up to be the best you can possibly be. So I think if, if people understand that from you, they're going to create better selves and they're going to create better environments and safer environments and all of that. If, Forgiveness is part of it, but go ahead. I you wanted to jump in there. No, no, Jerry. I, I, I was going to say, you know, it's amazing. We started this conversation off with humility. We're coming to the back end of it, and we're talking about forgiveness, and we're bringing in the spiritual concepts. But fundamentally, that's what it is, isn't it? It's the and and what I see 
which is very, very sad, is our people, the inability to forgive or they don't want to forgive is happening because they're hiding behind the power associated to certain titles. I'm the coach. I'm the assistant coach. I'm the senior player, you know, and they use the limitation of a title from holding back their personal growth and development, mm. the development of them as a person. Mm. So we started this conversation beautifully saying we coach the human behind the athlete, the human behind the CEO. And I think that needs to be salient in every single coaching conversation, every single day, in every single rocker room. That, mm -hmm. listen, we're going to win some, we're going to lose some, right? Sometimes certain calls are going to go our way. Some are not going to go our way. But what you don't want to be doing is you don't want to be sitting on your porch 30 years from now and having the world remember you for these things. Or you don't want to sit there and remember that experience. You know, forgiveness, the power to forgive is one of the most elevating, enriching, and enlightening energies there is. Well, they, if you, they, yeah, I'm sorry, no, but, no, Jerry, but you just hit it to me on the head. It's the most enlightening, but it's elevating, isn't it? I mean, it, it makes you feel so good. How can you not perform well? We came back to the thoughts and the feelings again, but go ahead. No, Jerry, I was going to say, you know, when you practice this every single day, uh, you guys have also worked with 350 teams is, is absolutely remarkable. And, you know, I was going to say that when you talk of real greatness, real, real greatness, you know, I've worked with some people who are exceptional. The records uh, speak volumes and, and you cannot question that they're the best. But there's a tier just above them as well who have equally amazing records and talents. But, you know, there's a difference in greatness. There's a type of person who's great that walks in the room and they want to remind you that they're great, mm -hmm. right? And there's a type <laughs> of greatness that walks in the room and is so self-assured and self-confident of what they've done that they know that the 10 seconds you spend with them could be life-changing for you. And they invest the 10 seconds in making sure that that experience is enriching. Mm. those are two different types of greatness yeah. and the difference between these two is in the confidence you have in yourself mm. yeah and the, the, john john that gets back to uh, the coaches some of the coaches we've interviewed like a steve kerr uh or cindy or all the great coaches seem to have what uh, uh shamal is saying well david david cook the sports psychologist and author he's got a new book out called greatness and he defines it as selfless exceptionalism and I really like that concept and just how you described it there, the, this recognition that this time, this moment, be it 10 seconds, be it 30 seconds, if I can selflessly give in that moment and make this person I'm talking to the most important person in the room, that can be life-changing for that person. And I think that's the quality when I think of the best coaches that I've ever met worked with, been mentored by, talked to, it would be selfless exceptionalism, that they're exceptional at what they do and they do it for completely selfless reasons. And they and they really have an, the ability to make you feel like the most important person in the room. And if you possess yeah. those qualities, you're going to influence a lot of people in the in your world. Yeah. Yeah. Well mm. said. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. Well, wow. taking a lot of your time here, I want um, to you just to tell people the new book is Breathe, Believe, Balance, A Guide to Self-Discovery and Healing. Um, <laughs> the, the quote on the cover from one of your re reviewers is, I wish I had read this 20 years ago, which is always a good thing. Um, tell people where they can get this book and um, how they can... Uh, connect with you and, and follow your work. Uh, thank you so much, firstly, for having me. Uh, the book's available on Amazon, uh, mostly. And uh, you can follow me on Instagram. I'm at uh, Shamal, S-H-A-Y-A-M-A-L, or on Twitter at uh, Shamal V, S-H-A-Y-A-M-A-L-V. And uh, I'm very sort of responsive in there, or you can just drop an email through any one of those platforms, and I will... Uh, Right back. It's if you want the email is connect with shamal at gmail.com. And um, 
so that those are the easiest ways to sort of get in touch. Awesome. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for the great book. Thanks for being on in this wonderful hour that just flew by of uh, tons of concepts that we we talk a lot, but we've never taken, I don't think, such a deep dive into some of this self-awareness and balance. And I think it's really important. And I feel like this is one of those um, podcasts we've done that m- may not be for everybody, but for the right person, this is going to be incredibly impactful. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, John. Thank you, Jerry. It was an absolute pleasure to be here. Namaste. (laughs) Namaste. I appreciate it. Jerry, that was uh, quite the discussion here today, wasn't it, (laughs) with Shamal? Um, This concepts of balance and self-awareness and forgiveness, things that we touch on a lot, but uh, I think that was a really important deep dive. What do you think? I I think uh, that's a massive understatement. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, I've had a lot of resistance. I started out 45 years ago, John, with this concept of sport and spirituality. And I got, you know, people were like, yeah, right. Good luck with that. Right. Mm -hmm. Like sarcastically. But what happened was over 45 years, people become educated. And, uh, you know, I don't have to wave any flag about spirituality. But when we're talking about courage and the things that he talked about, uh, you know, I, I feel uh, that the time has come and what we're doing in our podcast is we're catching that wave and, and, and we're jumping on board with this and mm-hmm. we're making the world know, hey, you know, we're, uh, we're aware that this is important and we, mm-hmm. we endorse it and support it and we'll continue to do that. Mm-hmm. You know, come my big sort of takeaways you know, I like the, one of the quotes I wrote down from clarity of purpose comes clarity of execution. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a great, he was talking about it with the, within the context of what are we doing in practice today? And I also think it's a phenomenal concept within the context of why are you part of this program? Right. W- what are we really? doing here? Right. Like I, I think, about these talks that I give to parents of kids who are trying to decide whether they're going to sign their child up for an organization or a team or whatever. Well, what's the clarity of our purpose here? I should define that. And it's not to make your kid a better soccer player, Mm. right? It's to develop Mm -hmm. the human being, the Mm. human behind the athlete, as, as Shamal said, right? And we just use soccer as the vehicle or basketball as the vehicle or lacrosse as the vehicle, yeah. But the purpose is so much greater than that. It's your child's character. It's their community service. It's how they treat each other. Yeah. Um, that's it's, what's going to really, really matter. Um, it's the, it's the uh, what I like to say is the microcosmic classroom for all of life. Mm-hmm. And uh, all the greats, the great coaches, the great athletes, they would admit that right up front, right mm-hmm. straight out. I mean, there's no doubt that everything I am today in my life, and John, you might agree with this for yourself, is the result of me having competed at a high level, is the result of me understanding myself in relation, not just to sport, but to life. And sport became that that wonderful vehicle. Uh, one, of, one of the things that, uh, one of the takeaways I had, very simple statement, but boy, it's really magnanimous, is uh, control is a myth. Mm-hmm. Those were his words. And for all of us on this podcast, think about it. How many coaches get into trouble because they think and believe that they can control the athlete? You cannot Mm -hmm. control the athlete. You cannot control the outcome. You cannot control results. So why do we set it up so that we get devastated when we lose instead of learning from it? And, And so control is a myth. And uh, in fact, the, the more we let go of the irony of it is what I've discovered is the more I let go of my need to control, the more control I have. Mm-hmm. People mm-hmm. are more comfortable with more space without me trying to micromanage. And I think a lot of coaching out there, a lot of coaches think they're good coaches because they micromanage and they've got everything you know dialed in and everything's perfect. And But then all of a sudden something happens and they don't know what happened. God, I'm losing control. And, mm-hmm. and that loss, that idea of loss of control for a coach is very uh, instrumental in, in the decisions they make with their team uh, because of the fear of losing control. 
So they won't include the athletes, let's say, in a, a decision making process or in like, let's how let's see how this practice goes. I want some input from the team here. What do you guys want to do? Or what do you girls want to do? Uh, and they're afraid to lose control. So they won't do that. And then there's no buy in and there's no ownership. And it, it's the ramifications for that one little statement. Control is a myth mm -hmm. uh, is, is vast. Mm hmm. Hey, amen to that. Well, we can keep going and going, but uh, I hope everyone yeah. enjoyed the podcast and this great conversation and took lots of notes like Jerry and, and myself here. Again, the book is Breathe, Believe, and Balance. Um, and you can... Uh, I, I call it the killer bees. The killer bees. And uh, you can find um, <laughs> at, you know, you can find, you can follow uh, Shamal's work at Shamal S H A Y A M A L on Instagram, or just add a V to that for his last name on Twitter. Um, but yeah, that was great. Uh, before we sign off, Jerry, super excited here about the launch of our new book, The Champion oh, Teammate. Wow. Um, just getting that out there to the world here when this podcast plays. Uh, it's going to be it's uh, it's live now on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and everywhere you can get it. But I mean, I I'm so excited for it. The initial readers loved it. Uh, we've been kind of blown away by the initial response of people who oh, wanted boy. to pre-order the book, and yeah. uh, it's it's pretty exciting. Uh, so we're super excited about uh, the champion teammate. And you know, if you have your team, you you want to do a team read for the summer. This is this is a book right here that you know a middle school age, high school age, college team. It's 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 the perfect book to uh, to sort of get all these things that Shamal was just talking about in, in alignment for next season, the relationships, the environment, right, right, the competitive right. environment, um, right. mind and the body. And what, what great material to, as you mentioned, uh, not only to read, but wow, when the, when the team comes together in the fall, you know, the whole thing about having conversations, you want to spend like, Every Monday for 20 minutes, just talk, take a pick a topic and just discuss it for 20 minutes, then go out and practice and see how it's reflected in your practice. Yeah. Yeah. And exactly. uh, it's that simple. And, yeah. and we have all of it. It's very pragmatic, which, which I love, you know? Yeah. I know. Yeah. Amen. Amen to that. Awesome. Perfect. And everyone, final reminder we're getting towards, uh, d-day here where we're going to release any extra hotel rooms in our hotel block. So if you've been, on the fence about registering for the way champions conference and coming to the live one, you better do so now. Um, you it's August 4th, 5th, and 6th. Uh, you can do that on my website, change the game project.com uh, just under the main menu um, and get yourself signed up. And then we also have this live stream version of it this year as well. So you can sign up for either of those right now. And if you have a group of people um, bring your group um, cause we'll give you a nice discount. So yeah. Awesome. Well, Jerry, thanks again for being part of uh, this great interview. And thanks to uh, Shamal and uh, all of you for listening. Remember, your influence is never neutral, right, sir? Pleasure. I love it. Thank yeah, you for yeah. having me here. Yep. Yeah, your influence is never neutral. So go out there, make a positive difference this week. And uh, we'll yeah. see you again next week.